This is Talking Foreign Policy, a critical look on Canada's role abroad, and I'm Eve Engler. And today we're going to be discussing uh, the NATO Summit 75-year birthday celebration, as some people are, are framing it, of the uh, belligerent alliance uh, taking place in uh, Washington, D.C. in uh, the start of next week. Uh, in Canada, the main thing we hear about NATO certainly in recent weeks and months, is that the Canadian government has not been pulling its weight, uh, its commitments under NATO of reaching 2% of GDP spending for the military. That's the sort of main discussion we hear. Obviously, also, we hear a lot about NATO uh, role in Ukraine, and Canada has uh, uh, troops stationed as part of a NATO mission in Latvia for the past um, uh, seven years. But when we hear these discussions or, you know, historically Canada's role in NATO's bombing in Libya or Afghanistan or Yugoslavia and the discussion about increasing military spending to attain the NATO target of 2% 2, 2 GDP, it's very rare that we ever hear about what NATO was for, what was founded for and sort of the background of NATO. And, and the question very rarely comes up of whether Canada... Uh, you know, whether we should be part of this alliance. And so they say we have to spend 2% of GDP, but, you know, can we just opt out of the alliance? Can we just get out of the alliance? So so I thought, first of all, I'd go into a little bit of history of Canada's role in the thinking with the establishment of NATO. Canada was one of the three main countries in the founding of NATO in the early discussions in 1947, 48, uh, in the lead up to the 1949 establishment of the alliance. And from the Canadian government perspective, there were sort of two main motivations for uh, promoting the establishment of NATO. One was to blunt uh, the European left, which after World War II had, um, had a lot of credibility. It was, of course, the communists who had resisted against the fascist forces in Europe. And so um, the, there was a lot of feeling that the communism was the wave of the future. And Canadian officials uh, saw very clearly the establishment of NATO and specifically stationing uh, tens of thousands of uh, North American troops in Western Europe as a way to blunt um, the rise of, of indigenous communist parties in Italy, in France, uh, Greece, elsewhere elsewhere in, in Western Europe. And, and uh, Lester Pearson, who was then, of course, Canada's foreign affairs minister and a major player in the establishment of NATO, he referred to raising the hearts and minds and spirits of all those in the world who love freedom, that confidence and faith which will restore their vigor. So in discussing the establishment of NATO. And then in maybe his most, um, one of my, my favorite quotes that Lester Pearson ever said, in March of 1949, in the House of Commons, Lester Pearson, in, in a, a debate around NATO, he said, quote, the power of the communists, wherever that power flourishes, depends upon their ability to suppress and destroy the free institutions that stand against them. They pick them off one by one, the political parties, the trade unions, the churches, the schools, the universities, the trade associations, even the even the sporting clubs and the kindergartens. <laughs> the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is meant to be a declaration to the world that this kind of conquest from within will, will not in the future take place amongst us. So basically the communists were going for the kindergartens in Western Europe, and therefore we needed to establish NATO to, uh, to protect the, the kindergartens from the, the communist uh, uh, take, takeover. So part of it was about blunting the European left, the, the sort of communist socialistic left that was on the ascendance after World War II. And the other part of establishing NATO, uh, from my perspective, or I think from the Canadian government's perspective, was that basically it was about reinforcing uh, European colonial rule, which had weakened uh, the European colonial powers, of course, weakened during World War II, uh, but, but reinforcing European colonial rule, but really bringing it under the US-led geopolitical umbrella. And, uh, and Canada with a close relationship uh, to Washington uh, and without its own uh, formal colonies, it saw it's, you know, it tagging its future to this U.S. empire and U.S. geopolitical umbrella that NATO was part of was, uh, you know, it made sense from the Canadian uh, elite's perspective. And if you look at the uh, early years in NATO, Canadian officials justified uh, Western imperialism in, in the Middle East and Asia, uh, all on the grounds that it was, you know, defensive 
uh, in the context of the NATO alliance. And concretely, in terms of European colonial uh, rule, Canada delivered huge amounts, billions and billions of dollars in NATO mutual assistance program weaponry to the European colonial powers in the 1950s, uh, while they were suppressing the independence movements in Vietnam, in Vietnam, the French Vietnam, or in Algeria, the, the Belgians in the Congo, the, the uh, Brit, uh, Britain in Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we reinforced that European colonial rule, but also while sort of simultaneously uh, strengthening the U.S. empire and, and turning the U.S. into supporting the U.S. becoming the, main, the world's major uh, hegemon. To discuss NATO, um, uh, we, we are lucky to have with us uh, David Swanson, who is the executive director of World Beyond War, and he's the co-author of a recent book uh, titled uh, NATO, What You Need to Know. First of all, thanks a lot for coming on Talking Foreign Policy, David. Hi, Eve. Thanks for having me. And so I guess my first question is just the, can you sort of uh, explain the motivation in the establishment of NATO from, from your perspective, from a U.S. perspective and, and your research into the, into the matter? Well, my perspective and the perspective of the U.S. government are two completely different things. Uh, NATO, as you say, was, of course, established uh, to enforce U.S. control uh, and power and involvement in Europe uh, and to build up a, a military uh, with the enemy seen as the Soviet Union. This was followed years afterwards by the Warsaw Pact's creation by the Soviet Union uh, and by the rejection of, of Russia as a member of NATO, which has been rejected a few times over the, the decades uh, because it's much more useful as an enemy. Without Russia as an enemy, it's hard to have NATO. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union came and went, the Warsaw Pact came and went, NATO only grew. Uh, and so, you know, those who, who think there was some sort of logic, some sort of sense in having an institution like NATO up until 1991 uh, may or may not think it makes any sense post-1991. I don't think it ever made the slightest bit of sense. The way people imagine NATO, the popular imagination of NATO is an alliance of representatives of democratic nations who've gotten together and said, we're going to come to each other's aid and protection, including with military defense, if one of us is attacked by some outside nation invading a NATO member. Uh, it's, there, there's you know, not a word of truth in any of that. Uh, NATO is an institution principally devoted to weapon sales. It has more staff and uses more funding to arrange weapons deals than anything else. This is its primary raison d'etre. Secondarily, it is there to do the bidding and to cover for the crimes of one government, the United States government. Uh, it's, you know, it, it sells those weapons to its members and its partners, uh, many of which are openly the worst dictatorships on the face of the earth. Uh, it is not uh, itself a nation or representative or elected. Its leaders are not serving any constituency. Uh, it doesn't use democracy or transparency uh, within in its decision making. It uses coercion and threats and bribes and the United States pretty much always gets its way. Uh, it has never ever fought a war to collectively defend against an outside attack on a NATO member. It's never happened. It has only once even claimed to be doing such a thing, which was in response to the terrorist crimes of September 11th, 2001, even though every single NATO member has had foreign terrorist uh, attacks and none of them have been used uh, as a justification for a collective NATO war on some impoverished distant country, only when it was the United States. I mean, this was US politics choosing 
catastrophic, murderous, destructive, counterproductive on its own terms, 20 year catastrophe in Afghanistan, which is the principal accomplishment thus far of NATO uh, and the other nations all being dragged along. Uh, you know, and this followed, of course, how NATO discovered it could go on forever when the Soviet Union collapsed through waging wars in Bosnia and Serbia against a nation that had neither attacked nor threatened a NATO member without UN authorization, without even congressional authorization within the United States, just the NATO declaration of humanitarian war making to which has since been added with Afghanistan, the, the NATO declaration of revenge war making. You know, revenge doesn't exist in any law or treaty, but this is how they justify the war on Afghanistan. It's humanitarian and it's revenge. But of course, NATO didn't get involved until the United States had already single-handedly gone and attacked Afghanistan and overthrown the government. You know, and now they have wars when they want to. 2011, NATO decides to attack Libya and overthrow the government of Libya, uh, uses a UN resolution on protecting Libyans to claim it has the right to wage a war and bomb the place and overthrow the government. Uh, so this is, you know, this is out of control. And it badgers its members and its prospective members to, as you say, put more of their resources into weapons as, as if it's a public service, as if the more money you've got, the more you should invest in mass murder and the needs of your people and, and everything good that money could go to be damned. Uh, so, and, and of course, this shuts off the alternatives of nonviolent solutions to problems. Here, here I'm listening to fireworks. I don't know if you can hear them, but people are celebrating not just the, the 75 years of NATO, but the 200 whatever of the United States of the war for limited freedoms for limited people, but also for empire and for slavery and for power uh, of the first war. And the United States military has hardly stopped to take a breath from 1776 to this day. And so friends of the United States, like Canada, should not be assisting a war addict, should not be putting their names down as cover for a war addict. You know how much easier it is for the White House or the Congress to sell the U.S. public on a war when NATO is involved. People think it legalizes the thing. People confuse NATO with the United Nations. Uh, you know, it, it's a real disservice to the world for nations to be facilitating the U.S. war habit uh, by legitimizing it through this grand criminal cartel called NATO, which, of course, doesn't legalize anything, doesn't legitimize anything, but people think it does. You, you mentioned uh, NATO as being a kind of arms dealer, arms broker, facilitator of weapon sales. And I know that in the in the 1990s, uh, mid 90s, uh, the, some of the big uh, arms companies uh, were the ones that really began to push some big American like Lockheed Martin alike. Uh, began the push for NATO expansion eastward in uh, into Europe, despite the you know promises for uh, you know not an inch eastward in terms of NATO expansion. Now uh, Canada was a big proponent of uh, of NATO expansion eastward, and it was often even Jean Chrétien's government in early '90s was even pushing harder than Bill Clinton was. And I, I've I've stated that part of that is because Canadian arms companies are essentially part of the U.S. Uh, military industrial base via the de uh, defense production sharing arrangement, which makes that they can export to the Pentagon, you know, without any, uh, you know, tariffs or whatnot. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so, so, and so, and of course that NATO expansion is a central part in understanding the Russian invasion of a bit, a bit over two years ago, which was is, is you know very brutal and and I I believe count, contrary to international law, but there is this background uh, uh, context of uh, of NATO expanding eastward and sort of provoking uh, Russia. Now we're in a situation where at this NATO summit, they're they've they kind of been dangling Ukraine joining NATO, but they're not really going to let Ukraine join NATO. Um, 
And, uh, and, but they also want to sort of what they're calling Trump proof, uh, the NATO proxy war in Ukraine, in the case that Trump gets elected and decides to negotiate with Russia or whatnot. Um, yeah, can, can you just sort of speak a bit about the kind of NATO proxy war, the, the arms companies in that ex NATO expansion eastward in the sort of context uh, up until today? Yeah, I mean, I have to preface this by saying incredibly stupid things, uh, because if you don't, people, uh, be, as soon as you say one word against NATO, everyone thinks you simply adore or are in the pay of the Russian government, uh, because people are, are almost incapable of imagining opposing two sides of a war, even though thousands and millions of people in the United States are opposing both sides of a war in Palestine right now. They've almost never been able to comprehend it ever in history on any other war, including right now on Ukraine. And so I have to agree with you, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, mass murderous, criminal, inexcusable, absolutely predictable, predicted, uh, strategized for, provoked uh, by NATO. Uh, and of course, absolutely predictable that the Russian invasion would be an enormous boost to NATO. The Russian government can't have imagined anything else. Uh, everyone could see that coming. Uh, and of course, the response, oh, Russians, Russia's become aggressive. We need even more NATO is equally counterproductive. You know, there's it's madness on both sides in a vicious cycle. Uh, but you don't have to take it from peace advocates like me that NATO provoked the Russian invasion. The Secretary General of NATO tells you this. He says this is why Russia invaded Ukraine, because we refused to say we wouldn't put Ukraine in NATO. This is what it was all about. The Secretary General of NATO. It, it, it's, it's a weird situation where this guy runs around the world doing joint press conferences with presidents and prime ministers as if he is one. But if he were one, the people he represents would be outraged, at least that he blurted out what was supposed to be the quiet part. Uh, but he gets away with this stuff. Uh, I, I think it is it would be laughable if it weren't risking World War III and the ending of all life on Earth that NATO bragged last year about having trained 800 officials in Ukraine to not be corrupt, to be as uncorrupt as a, you know, as what a U.S. politician bought and paid for. Uh, and yet the excuse NATO is seems they're going to use at this 75th anniversary celebration in Washington, D.C., to not put Ukraine into NATO is that Ukraine is too corrupt still. Uh, and the funny part, if it weren't so disastrous, is that the real reason is almost certainly that NATO has failed in extreme efforts to corrupt its own members enough to put Ukraine into NATO. It has members that are too smart and too uncorrupted. Uh, to want World War III that directly and, and definitively. Uh, and so NATO is going to continue saying, no, no Ukraine in NATO just yet, but sooner or later, for sure. And as long as they keep saying sooner or later, for sure, and as long as they keep saying escalate the war and advocating for and assisting in attacks on Russian facilities, and NATO pushing its master, the U.S. government, to allow its weapons to be used in attacks in Russia, Frankenstein monster in the driver's seat here, uh, there's not going to be any solution to the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, when the, when the central sticking point in Russia's proposal December 2001, March 2002, and ever since has been no to NATO, uh, you know, you're not going to you're not going to solve the war diplomatically. And the then the offers from Russia are going to get worse and worse uh, for NATO. You could have had a much better deal prior to the invasion or at that negotiations a month in where it seems uh, a, a deal may have been very close to happening before the U.S. and the U.K. said, no, no, don't do it. Here's the weapons. Agreed. Uh, it definitely looks very grim from a Ukrainian perspective. There's probably lots of Ukrainians that are, I think, increasingly realizing how much they've been sort of played by NATO in all this, um, which to a large extent seems to be a, a policy of fighting to the last uh, uh, Ukrainian.
Um, so shifting shifting geograph geographically a little bit. Um, now NATO is supposed to be North Atlantic region, but increasingly it's as the U.S. has turned towards a contain China's uh, rise kind of policy. NATO is increasingly uh, refers to uh, China and sort of critical of China. And uh, and there's some increasing relations with Japan and the like. Can you talk a little bit about sort of NATO's um, direction towards China and its sort of policy uh, in uh, East Asia? Yeah, I mean, as you know, NATO has dramatically increased its membership. But apart from the United States and Canada, its members have to be in Europe. Uh, but it gets around that limitation by adding partners and partners have the added advantage that NATO does not commit to joining in any war that its partners are in if they claim to have been attacked. Uh, it can if it wants to, and it probably will, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and so NATO has partners now around the globe, in Asia, in the Pacific, in Latin America. It's a global institution. NATO is part of the Israeli war machine in this war in Palestine. NATO is part of the RIMPAC war exercises, war rehearsals, this massive war game exercise that's just been going on in the Pacific Ocean, uh, where uh, people are talking about the organization of an, of an Asian NATO, uh, where Asian countries and Pacific countries have been made NATO partners and sort of side alliances uh, have been set up, such as AUKUS, uh, which puts Australia and the United Kingdom and the United States into a weapons buying, weapons uh, facilitating, training, upgrading, and militarization deal, uh, all with the goal of threatening China. Uh, there is an absolute obsession in the U.S. government with China. China is is at China and the danger of China and the threat of China. And with this very intentional blurring of any possible line between economic competitor China and war enemy China uh, is the vast majority of conversation on the floor of the United States Congress, both houses, every committee uh, in the halls of Capitol Hill, you would think that China had attacked the United States. Uh, and this is what NATO hears. This is what will dominate the NATO meeting, apart from the Ukraine topic. Uh, when NATO meets this week in Washington, D.C., uh, there is an absolute obsession with driving toward war with China. Uh, and the people of Japan don't want it. The people of Korea, of Australia, of the Philippines don't want it. People of the United States don't want it and don't have a clue that it's going on. Uh, you know, the people in Australia, New Zealand have more idea what's going on than in the United States. Uh, and yet this is what is being built up toward. Uh, and the United States is putting more troops, more ships, uh, more war games, more weaponry, uh, is launching more missiles uh, as tests from California into the Pacific Ocean all with the aim of stopping China, of threatening China. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is a huge, huge danger. Um, it, it's, this, is, this is beyond the need to justify NATO's existence because they've managed to do that uh, very solidly uh, with talk of terrorists and pirates and Russia. Uh, they don't need China, but they're driven to it. Uh, it. It's part of the, the imperial mindset and the, and the weapons dealing mindset. Uh, and I don't know how you control it. Uh, when you think that the people, the people in charge of restraining this sort of madness of preventing a nuclear war are the same people who have denied Joe Biden's mental condition for years until they get a disastrous debate on television. Well, we can't have a disastrous World War III and then correct things. We have to correct them first. And I don't know, I don't know how we're going to make that happen without a great deal more awareness and activism by the people in the NATO countries.
Yeah, and I should say that the Canadian government, Canadian military have, um, Canadian military specifically have been, you know, really on board with following the U.S. into the contain China uh, policy, go at least back to 2017. They're already trying to set up a, a base in Singapore as part of uh, focusing on the region. Canadian naval vessels are obviously part of the RIMPAC. They're they as an Asia Pacific strategy. They have uh, they've increased it to. Uh, uh, three naval vessels in the region kind of at all times. Um, so Canada is totally joining that. Now you got into the whole question of, you know, the, what do we do? And so, so this weekend in uh, Washington, there is a counter summit, uh, you know, educational kind of counter uh, summit on NATO. And then there's also a mobilization. Can you tell us a little bit more? I guess maybe I'll just state, first of all, there's going to be some protests across the country in Canada as well. I know in Ottawa and Montreal, there'll be protests. I don't think they're going to be big. I think they'll be more in the dozens. I know there's something in Mon I'm thinking Mon on Monday in Vancouver. And I think there may be a few other places people can uh, you know, pay attention to your local peace groups. But yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what's been, what will be going on in, in Washington, D.C. this weekend and you know the broader kind of uh, challenge to NATO uh, taking place? Yeah, a lot's been going on and a lot is coming. Uh, World Beyond War and International Peace Bureau recently did a 24-hour peace wave Zoom call moving around the world with activities and protests and rallies happening around the globe in a circle, uh, many focused on NATO and RIMPAC. You can go to World Beyond War or International Peace Bureau and watch the videos. Um, there's been a peace walk going from Maine in the Northeast United States down to Washington, D.C. to join up with the the counter NATO events. Uh, the main website to go to is nonatoyespeace.org. If you go to nonatoyespeace.org, you see a calendar of events before, during, and after the NATO summit, including a, a big counter summit, which you can watch live or after the fact on video uh, that's happening on Saturday, July 6th in Washington, DC. If you're there, you can join in. If you're not, you can watch the video uh, with speakers from around the world, members of parliament from NATO nations in Europe who are supposed to absolutely adore NATO and thank it for, for their lives, uh, who are coming to speak uh, for better alternatives. Uh, and then uh, a protest rally in front of the White House on the afternoon of Sunday the 7th. Uh, and this is leading up to all kinds of events. Uh, I, I've written this book with Medea Benjamin, a wonderful co-author called NATO, What You Need to Know, uh, with a preface by Jeffrey Sachs. And we're going to be doing book events in Washington, uh, and there are going to be protests uh, of all the stink tanks doing their pro-NATO uh, events during the course of the week and the NATO events themselves uh, and the the likely to be disastrous Joe Biden press conference about the accomplishments of the NATO summit uh, that will be happening as well. Um, so watch the videos, uh, read the read the speeches if you can't be there. Um, but if you can, be in Washington or be at your local events uh, wherever you are. Thanks a lot, uh, David. Again, David uh, Swanson is executive director of World Beyond War and is the co-author of uh, NATO, What You Need to Know. So you can uh, check that out. Thanks a lot for coming on Talking Foreign Policy. Thank you, Eve.